Uh, this one it talks to the uh, evolution of technology and the maturation of technology. And if you look on the left side of that chart, this is getting to the point I just made, that the evolution is happen happening so rapidly in technology, it's hard for us to keep up with, with new equipment. We have to respond to new threats, and the threats can appear overnight. We have to provide insertion of technologies rather than wait for a whole new generation of equipment so that the, what you have is a block zero of a piece of equipment, a block one, two, three, four, as the technologies mature. That's the best way to do it for the soldier, and that's what we're going to try to do. You have to have a horizontal view. What that means is you can't just worry about transmissions. You can't just worry about engines. And you can't just worry about tanks, because the tank might not be a good enough node in the information network. So you have to look across the disciplines. The electrical engineers have to talk to the mechanical engineers. Mechanical engineers have to talk to the software engineers. And you have to integrate a system. And one of the things I've found looking into academia is that our programs in system engineering at most of the best universities are worthless, lousy, nowhere near as good as the programs in stovepiped, mechanical, electrical, information, chemical, metallurgical engineering. We need to develop systems engineers, and right now we have to do it on the job, and we have to do it after like 20 years of experience, people like Al Frisaka and others working in industry for 20 years before they really are good enough to put together a system. And then, and then finally, require a program funding that is, has stability. I think that's very important. Uh, maturing technology, you can read those fairly straightforward. Realistic maturity of the technologies. Uh, they are revising this technology readiness assessment process, and it's based upon a lot of complaints from people like Marilyn, myself, and others in the other services that you can't just give a technology a number like a TRL-4 or a TRL-6 or whatever. And when you interpret the definition that we have right now in the books for TRL levels, they can be, they can be interpreted in 50 different ways. And this, these are the kinds of things that we have to do to, to have our measurement of mature technologies done a little bit better than it's done now. Identify resource needs. I think all of us need more resources. Uh, I think we need more personnel resources. We need more grad students. Uh, we need people. Uh, it was interesting, I, and this is just kind of off the, off the subject, but I think it is relevant. And that is, I was told the other day, and I, I, don't, I can't verify these statistics, but it came across, and I think they're close. But it was that a fourth grade student in America today is in the top 10 of fourth grade students in the world. Uh, an eighth grade student in America today is in the top, I think it's 25, of the nations of the world. And a 12th grade student in America today doesn't even register in the top 100 uh, nations in the world. And what we have is this diversion from the intellectual pursuits as the child reaches his mid-teens and later teens. And you see that in fewer and fewer people selecting engineering, science, mathematics, and it's necessary for us to go off, offshore now to get the skills that we need in our, in our young engineers and scientists. Uh, that is something, fortunately, we've been able to do, uh, but it, this source is not going to be available forever. Uh, they will be, these students from China, India, and these other countries will be motivated if, they're, if their nations are smart. They'll be mo motivated to stay home and not to emigrate to places like the United States. Don't assume success. I mean, that's pretty obvious. Uh, I don't think many of us assume success. Anybody who's been around for a while understands that it's harder to achieve success than to continue to fail. And then admit when you have a bridge too far. It's interesting. I saw that movie over the weekend, A Bridge Too Far. I have, uh, I've been an airborne soldier, and I know how it, how it is when you uh, don't have any more ammunition and you don't have any more food and uh, your will to fight starts dwindling very quickly. And what happened in that scenario, it's a real scenario, was uh, there was a British Corps that was supposed to link up with a British division in Arnhem in the Netherlands in World War II, and the Corps never made it to Arnhem, so the Germans captured 
the British division. And there were a lot of people lost in that, uh, in that battle. It, that's where the words bridge too far came from. Next view graph. Uh, what this view graph shows is the necessity for the Army to have external review, independent review, by some very prestigious groups. Uh, what is on the, uh, the top of that uh, chart, the top gear, is the Army Science Board. On the right side is the Board on Army Science and Technology, and I was fortunate enough to be the chairman of that board for four years. And then the RAND Royal Center. RAND, you know, has a Project Air Force that supports the Air Force. It has a, an Arroyo Center that supports the Army, and we work very closely, my office works very closely with Tim Bonds and others at RAND uh, doing uh, independent studies for us. It's nice to have organizations like these three who will tell the emperor he has no clothes. And I assure you that those three organizations have done it. They've done it recently, and I've tried to take it with a smile, uh, as, as we should. But those organizations, you need to think about, those of you who want to contribute, you need to think about someday joining one of those, uh, one of those organizations, working with one of those organizations, because we respect them significantly. I don't know how many Nobel Prize winners right now are on the BAST, but we have access to probably 50 if we need them any time. Uh, significant capability that is used by the Army. Next view, Graf. Uh, two elements of our strategy are to rebalance. I think that's uh, something that Marilyn mentioned for full spectrum responsiveness. Full spectrum means war of any flavor. It means having systems that are modular, so you can have a you can have a tank that weighs a heck of a lot if it's going into very heavy combat. And the same tank, you can remove some modules, and it can go into a a, a third world uh, a contingency environment where you don't have the kind of tank threat that you might have otherwise. So uh, full spectrum is very important, and and again, it's something that may be mentioned today by the vice chief of staff. And then reform our institutions, including DoD, and we I have a lot of leverage. Uh, for those of you who don't understand, I have a channel through the Secretary of the Army, of course, because I'm an Assistant Secretary, but I also am the Army Procurement Executive, so I have a channel through the uh, OSD, through uh, Dr. Carter, who's the Under Secretary of Defense. So I, ha I have a purple channel and I have a green channel, and it's very helpful, uh, and I can influence the uh, DOD institutions as well as the uh, Army institutions. Next. Uh, this is a little bit about the efficiency drill. This is where I, we get into the uh, initiatives coming out of the Defense Department. This is uh, Secretary Gates and Dr. Uh, Ash Carter, uh, their initiative. And the initiative is to save about 2 to 3 percent of revenues of income for the Army and turn that into capability for the Army. Uh, the guidance that I've gotten is that every dollar I save in being more efficient in terms of management, contracting, uh, getting stuff to the field more quickly so you don't pay uh, a large uh, bill for uh, time, wasted time, we can use to buy more tooth, more capability for the Army. And so far they've been, they've, uh, they've been very responsive to that and we've already had redirection of hundreds of millions of dollars of saving back into the Army, which I think is great. Lean Six Sigma, as you notice, uh, projects uh, are a significant part of that. And we've been doing those for a long time, as you all know. Many of you are probably green belts, purple, whatever color belts uh, you have for Lean Six Sigma. I'm a nothing belt. I have no idea of what, you know, what level I would be in Lean Six Sigma. But what it's done is it's, given, it's infused some life into that program, which was a great program when it started and I think will continue to be a great program. But programs like that always need some stimulus, and it, we are now working very hard with uh, things like Lean and Six Sigma. Next view graph. Uh, our responsibilities, uh, I mentioned the soldier. I also wanted to mention the fact that we have a responsibility to our own workforce. It has been found in uh, a number of studies that our workforce is underrepresented in certain areas, like contracting. Uh, some of the reason that we have wasted money in contracting is because we haven't had the expertise that we needed to enforce 
the proper layout of the contracts, the proper monitoring of the contracts, management, and things like that. So it's very important. Our partners are very important, and you all, uh, again, are on our team. And as you go, as you go around that, uh, that circle there, you see the partners include the Joint Community, the, Ar the Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps, the academics, uh, the American people, of course, are very important key. The Congress, uh, they provide us the resources that come from your tax money. Uh, our international partners, and a number of them are represented today. I see the uniforms from Israel, from Germany, uh, from some of our other allies. Welcome and thank you for being here. Uh, and our industry partners. Uh, one of the th comments I made to the Secretary when I came in uh, to Secretary Gates and to uh, Secretary McHugh was that I'd never seen a worse environment when I was out in industry trying to work with the Army than I'd ever seen in my career. I was not invited. I was not welcome. I was treated as you would have treated the Taliban or Al-Qaeda. As a matter of fact, I was treated with less respect than I think a Taliban warrior would have been treated. And I said, we really have to fix that because nothing will get done without industry. Nothing will get done by us because we don't build stuff. We buy stuff, but we don't build stuff. And I'm trying to fix that, and I think the Army and, and the DOD, I think, have gotten that message. We've got to work more closely and in, in a more fraternal way with industry. I, I told them that when I was out in, in Lockheed Martin, I knew what I could tell you and what I couldn't tell you. I knew what was Lockheed proprietary, and I wasn't about to tell anybody what was Lockheed proprietary. I would trust the Air Force, I would trust the Army to be able to do the same thing. And I do that right now. I'll bring industry into my office. I'm not going to tell them how much money I have to spend on a particular system. And if they ask, I'll tell them no. I mean, it, it doesn't take a, 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 a high school sophomore intelligence to be able to protect a piece of information. Uh, and then ultimately our responsibility is to the American people. They have been just grand uh, in, this, uh, in the scenario we've been in for the last 20 years. I served at a time when they advised me not to wear my uniform when I came home. Uh, they said, you might, you might be accosted in the Oakland terminal if you wear your uniform. And what I said was, well, if I'm accosted, I'll kill him, whoever he is, because I have more respect for the people I fought because they believed in something. These people believe in nothing. And I'll wear my uniform, and I did. And, and most of my friends wore the uniforms, but some were worried. The, the guys who were married were worried. They weren't afraid for themselves, but they were afraid for their wives and kids. So the American people are great. God bless them. And we're doing everything we can to uh, make them proud of us, all of us. Next. Uh, this is my wrap-up chart. I think you all understand these things. I'll just let you read them. Last but not least is logistics. Very often we don't think about it. There's a lot of science in logistics. There's a lot of technology in, in logistics. And if you look at the life cycle of a system, I think it's about 70 to 80 percent of the cost is in sustainment logistic support. Transporting it, sustaining it after it gets there, repairing it when it's broke, putting fuel into it, lubricants into it, and at the same time making sure the soldier is, uh, is safe and protected. Uh, my last chart is this one. Next. And this is the thing that I underscore with my people, and I think it's something all of us can look to. I, I don't think there's any question about the, the honor and integrity part, but it's this, this idea of moral courage. And what that means is being able to be the person who says no when everybody else says yes. I can think of a scenario where we were in a, a group with the Secretary of the Army, the Chief Staff of the Army. We went around the table because we had decided on a course of action, we thought. And everybody put his thumb up, and it got to one person, and he put his thumb down. And everybody jumped on that person, but that person stayed in his lane. And he said, the reason that I'm saying that it's not a good idea is point one, point two, and point three. 
And finally, all of the rest of the people in the room said, oh, what option do you want? And he said, I think option two is the best option. And everybody said, well, I, I vote for option two. I vote for option two. I vote for option two. And it was him sticking with his conviction that caused, I think, the right decision to be made. And that's the kind of thing that we have to search ourselves for. Sometimes it's easy to just vote with the, with the majority. Sometimes it's hard to be that person who says, no, I feel based upon my expertise, my scientific background, my experience, it shouldn't be that, it should be something else. And that's where I tell my, my people that I want them to focus because I trust their honor and I trust their integrity. Uh, that concludes my remarks. Uh, I have about a minute if you have any uh, questions.